And now I would like to introduce Rich Kozil, coordinator of Roofing and Waterproofing TRG. Rich? Thank you, Thank you Maria. Um, yes, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Edis Oliver and Lance Vaccaro today as speakers. Edis is a professional engineer with over four years of experience in the construction and engineering field. Prior to that, Edis was a founder and owner of Oliver Roof Systems, Inc., which later became Edis Oliver and Associates, Associates, a licensed engineering and roof consulting firm in Texas. Alonzo Caro has been with WJE since 2006. Six. Alonzo is a registered roof observer, registered roof uh, consultant credential, a ACI field testing technician grade one, an ACI adhesive anchor installer, and C CSI construction documents uh, technologist. Um, He's also an experienced CAD drafter and project administrator. He's also a veteran of the United States Army. Alonso and Edis, over to you. Thank you, Rich. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk with you about this program today. Uh, our learning objectives are, uh, as shown on the screen, uh, we want to uh, show you some of the techniques we used in identifying a wet concrete deck and the sources of, of leakage that we had. We're going to show you some of the things we did to design the roof to go over this wet concrete deck. Uh, we also uh, were very heavily involved in the construction administration of this project and had to work out a number of application details with the contractor. And then at the conclusion of the project, we were granted a research project by WJE to follow on uh, evaluation of the wet concrete deck. This presentation today is going to be in three parts. Uh, the first phase was the original leak diagnosis and repair. We were originally hired to diagnose some leak problems in this uh, building and uh, later were asked to design the new roof for the project. Uh, as I said earlier, we were very involved in the construction administration phase and I've already mentioned the research project. So this particular project was a re-roofing project for the Sterling C. Evans Library at Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. Uh, the building, uh, the library is really in, uh, in four sections. You can see the uh, aerial view of it on the right. The four sections of roof are really four separate buildings. Uh, the original Cushing Memorial Library built in 1928. The first expansion in 1970, which is the primary subject of this presentation. Uh, the third phase, uh, built in 1979, and the fourth phase in 1996. Our project actually encompassed re-roofing uh, both the 1970 and the 1979 buildings. Uh, this is a particularly important project for us because it's the fourth project that we have done for Texas A&M University. Uh, Texas A&M University is the largest tier one research university in the southwest. It has 11 branch campuses that manage uh, eight state agencies in Texas. There are 840 buildings on the main A&M campus, and this is our first roofing project, so for obvious reasons, we wanted to get it right. So, uh, in the next slide here, you can see that uh, we were first engaged in 2010 to diagnose chronic roof leak problems. Uh, most of these problems occurred between the 1970 and the 1979 building at the interface between those two buildings. You can see the creative, uh, the creative uh, uh, leak management system inside the library uh, through these uh, pictures where the water was diverted into trash cans. This is a picture of the 1970 building, uh, viewing it from the 1979 building. The roof system on this building uh, consisted of essentially four parts. The underlying deck is an eight inch thick structural concrete deck, followed by lightweight insulating concrete poured over the structural concrete deck. Over that was the original coal tar pitch built up uh, gravel roof, and uh, at a later point in time, Texas A&M had applied urethane foam, uh, sprayed on polyurethane foam over the entire roof with a elastomeric coating. There's a large penthouse in the center of the roof, uh, and that the, sort of the tan area around the perimeter is a repair to the perimeter of the, of the penthouse roof with the urethane foam. Uh, as you can see, there's no parapet wall around this building. It's a gravel guard uh, perimeter, and uh, the roof flows to internal drains um, for the primary drainage and the edge of the roof for the overflow. 
Uh, this is another view showing the, the penthouse uh, roof and uh, the, the penthouse at the time we started work had no gutter around the perimeter of the penthouse. So uh, our initial assignment and initial investigation was to determine the source of these leaks in the library and fix those. Uh, the university had budgeted roof replacement, but it was set for about two years down the road. So we were not contemplating re replacing the roof at this point in time. So as you can see, this was a, a very serious <laughs> uh, water infiltration problem. And uh, we suspected from the outset that this was related to the uh, expansion joint of the through-all flashings at the interface between the 1970 and the 1979 building. Uh, the 1979 building is six stories tall, as opposed to the four stories that the uh, 1970 building is. So our first investigation was to evaluate uh, the through wall flashing or the expansion joint at the interface between the two buildings. And as you can see, there's a expansion joint slash uh, uh, base flashing at the interface, which has been foamed over by the polyurethane foam. You'll also notice there are no weep holes because the weep holes have been foamed over by the polyurethane foam as well. So a closer view shows that the elastomeric coating on the polyurethane foam has cracked and split and has begun to delaminate. And you can also again see that there are no visible weep holes uh, in, this, uh, in this image. So our first test was to conduct spray tests on the base flashing to see if in fact there was a leak in the base flashing itself. So using an AMA nozzle, uh, we uh, performed standard water test for uh, specific period of time to see if we could force any uh, water infiltration into the building. This did not leak. We did not get any leaks from this particular test. So our next step was to uh, introduce the ASTM C1715 uh, test for evaluating water leakage in uh, uh, masonry walls. And that test involves, uh, as many of you know, drilling holes in the wall, uh, putting plastic tubes in, and then metering water into the, the cavity of the wall uh, through a, a, a gauge and a, and a measuring system. And as we introduced that water in through the wall cavity, uh, water came into the building. So we were introduced water successfully through that. Now that, to explain this picture a little bit, the arrow is pointing to the deck, the concrete deck of the 1970 building. And the metal deck on the left hand side is the the metal uh, coriform decking uh, that supports the concrete floor, uh, the fifth floor, or fourth floor I guess it is, of uh, the 1979 building. And you notice sort of an overlap there. So they jackhammered off uh, part of the 1979, the 1970 uh, roof deck and overlapped the floor of the new building to that. And that's where the water was coming in. And that's where it was entering the building at least. So our next test was to determine how the water was doing that, how was the water penetrating through the through wall flashing. So we, we brought a, a brick mason in and, and uh, made openings in the brick wall to evaluate what the source of the leaks was. was. And this is the opening that we cut, which you can see, uh, uh, you can see the CMU, uh, the damp proofing on the CMU backup wall was an asphalt impregnated uh, uh, fabric material. You also can see the, the, the rope uh, the weep uh, rope at the bottom. So the, there were there were weep holes there, and they were in the original construction. They were just covered over. And this is a little closer view as we sort of dissected the flashing to see what the integrity of the damp proofing and the water proofing was. So there was asphalt impregnated fabric, damp proofing the wall, and a copper through wall flashing. However, what we what we observed upon closer investigation was that there were openings in the flashing and the laps were not well sealed, and the water was penetrating through that through wall flashing uh, into the building. And so we, we identified the openings and uh, that we suspected, and when we, when we flooded those areas with water, we, we successfully introduced quite a bit more water. Uh, this is a little closer picture of, uh, of what was there uh, on the, we said 1969, it was built actually over two years, 1969 and 1970 buildings. But again, that's a closer picture of the uh, masonry weaves there to show you what was what was happening there. So we identified the source of the uh, 
moisture in the in the moisture path, and I wanted to show you this cool animation. Uh, Alonzo Caro deserves all the credit for. Uh, you know, from the very outset, we thought that this uh, this particular detail needed to have running water, and so uh, we uh, Alonzo worked on that quite a bit, and uh, and I hope you I hope you enjoy that that cool animation, which shows exactly what was happening. And we're so proud of that. I'm gonna let that run for a second. Okay, well you you got it now. All right, so uh, we took out three courses of bricks. Uh, I say we, the contractor took out three courses of bricks under our direction, and we installed a complete new through wall flashing the full length of the wall, which is about 200 and something feet. And we elevated that flashing uh, 12 inches above the plane of the finished roof. And the reason we did that was, of course, in anticipation that the building might get re roofed in the next two or three years. We wanted to be sure that the new flashing could accommodate an additional uh, two to four inches of uh, roof insulation to comply with the uh, uh, the energy code uh, requirements. Well, so we took care of that leak, but there were more. Uh, as we already knew, there were other isolated leaks out in the open field of the roof, which we believe were around roof drains. Now, of course, this is a structural concrete deck, so that no matter where the leaks are entering, the actual roof membrane, they're going to flow, as you all know, to an opening in the concrete, and those openings were most likely going to be at roof drains. Uh, and this was a problem too. So there were other areas in the roof, in the, in the library that were protected uh, by plastic sheeting, uh, not just around that expansion joint. So sure enough, uh, as we continued our investigation, uh, we found that there were in fact leaks uh, around the roof drains and we continued to uh, check uh, all of the different roof drains in the building to see which ones might be emitting water. And this is just another picture of uh, uh, a leak at a, at a mechanical penetration. There were also some minor vents on the roof, not, not very much, as you saw from the earlier picture. So it's really a pretty clean roof. So some of these leaks have been so prevalent for so long, there are actually stalactites growing on the concrete. Uh, that concrete, we could tell and knew, and these pictures imply, that the concrete itself w was very wet. And we suspected this from the outset, even though the water was coming through the uh, roof drain openings uh, in the concrete deck. So one of the things that we did was we inserted inflatable plugs uh, in the roof drains, and we filled the drains up because what we wanted to be sure of was that it was in fact uh, leaking around the roof flashing and not a plumbing leak downstream. Uh, and sure enough, uh, we were able to introduce moisture around the roof flashings on a number of the drains, which confirmed our suspicion. And this again is just sort of another picture showing more of the same. And you can tell that that's been leaking for a while by the rust and corrosion around the, uh, around the cast iron piping. In addition, there were, since, as I mentioned earlier, there was a lightweight insulating concrete deck poured over the structural concrete deck. Um, vents were installed in the lightweight insulating concrete. That was a theory that was prevalent back in the 60s and 70s, that that would somehow vent the lightweight insulating concrete. And uh, we suspect the, uh, suspected these were also a source of moisture infiltration because some of the caps were loose and and uh, dislodged. So we also uh, investigated uh, moisture around these uh, deck vents. And finally, I guess the other thing we determined that was uh, was indicative of the condition of the roof was that the elastomeric coating was peeling off of the roof and it deteriorated. So whether they re-roofed the building or uh, or not, there was going to need to be other types of repairs uh, required to this roofing system. So the overview of our initial phase one investigation was that we had a single uh, a spray polyurethane foam roof applied over the through wall flashes and the masonry weeps. Uh, the through wall flashes were not properly sealed or attached to the backup wall. Uh, we had roof drain leaks, we had open roof vents, and we had a damaged or delaminated coating uh, at the uh, spray polyurethane foam. So we fixed the existing leaks in the roof. We fixed the expansion joint leak, we fixed the roof drain leaks. 
but at this point, the owner had, was leaning toward accelerating the re-roofing project. So uh, what does all of this mean? Well, I'm going to turn this over to my uh, partner here, uh, Alonzo Caro, to uh, carry on and explain what all this means. Alonzo. Thank you, Edis. So as Edis mentioned, um, we went around and figured out the issues with the roof leaks and wall um, penetration leaks also that we had in the through wall. The owner then selected to go ahead and proceed with the replacement of the roof. So the phase two portion of the project, we wanted to really understand what the construction or the system um, of the existing building was. So we selected to do roof openings um, for very many, for very many various uh, reasons. We wanted to see what the existing total existing roof system was. We wanted to see if there was multiple layers of roof systems. Um, we wanted to verify the thickness of the existing roof system. We also wanted to see where the actual slope of the deck was or slope in the insulation. Um, we wanted to confirm what the roof substrate and condition was. And knowing that we had lightweight concrete, we also wanted to perform full tests to, to ensure that our new system could be attached properly to the existing lightweight concrete. So here's a, the first opening that we did on the SDF roof. And the intent was to do it in layers. We wanted to see through every portion of the system. Um, so we selected to just cut through the first initial portion of the SDF to the built-up roof. And immediately we started to see that there was moisture in between the SDF roof and the built-up roof. Um, at this point, we tried to dry as best as possible the surface of the built-up roof using rags and, and shop vacs and proceeded to cut through the actual membrane. Once we cut through the membrane, we can see that moisture was also in between the built-up membrane and the top of the lightweight concrete. Um, at this point, we knew that there was a major issue with moisture, at least at this location. This was our, our first location we did the, uh, the opening. Uh, we went ahead and drilled or cored through the lightweight concrete. We did that for two reasons. We wanted to see if the moisture was all the way through the lightweight concrete or if it was just kind of at the top surface or maybe just the top portion of the lightweight. And we also wanted to know what the thickness of the lightweight concrete was. Um, as you can see from this photo, that core opening there was just full of water. And in some locations, um, we had approximately two and a half inches of water inside these uh, exploratory openings. So we knew we had some moisture, but we didn't really understand exactly how much moisture we had in that roof system or in that whole entire roof area. So we decided to take approximately nine additional core cuts throughout the roof. Um, we, we knew that we had a lot of moisture in our first one. As you can see, the first, second, and third were very close to each other, but we, uh, we found moisture in most of all these uh, core cut openings. Um, and like I said, we wanted to kind of get all different locations throughout that roof area to really understand how much moisture we had in that roof system. In this blue area here that you see highlighted is where we found most of the moisture in the system. That's where we had approximately, you know, two inches of water or so um, at our core cut locations. The yellow area there, um, we found to have moisture in the lightweight concrete, but not as much as in the blue area. We still had wet and damp lightweight concrete, um, but it wasn't as, as much as we saw in the blue area. The lighter gray area there at the left-hand side, bottom left-hand side, was the only areas we found that the lightweight concrete was dry. That was the only locations that we were doing the exploratory openings and we did not find any moisture in between the SPF or the built up or within the lightweight concrete. So just as an overview of what the system was that we uh, found as existing, uh, we had a concrete deck, we had two and a quarter inches of lightweight concrete, we had a three ply fiberglass felt and gravel, and then we had two inch foam on top of the, uh, the original a three ply system and we had about a, about half to three quarters of the 47,000 square feet is where we found most of that moisture so we had moisture in the lightweight concrete at about three quarters of the uh, 
the roof area. So now we're, we're getting into our design considerations and during the process of, of seeing what exactly we were going to do as far as the replacement of this roof, we knew we had to install new through wall flashings. We knew that we had to do new roof drain flashings and remove any abandoned vents and penetrations that were on the roof. But the real question was, what do we do with all that standing water and the wet lightweight concrete? So some of the things that we discussed within our group was, you know, do we salvage the lightweight concrete? Do we try to dry the lightweight concrete? Some of the options that we discussed was, you know, we can have a contractor go out there, drill some holes within the SPF and the lightweight concrete and try to vacuum out that moisture. But based on the amount of moisture that we saw in the system, we didn't know exactly how to really relay that to the contractors so they can, you know, bid the project. Uh, we didn't know if it needed, you know, 20 holes and uh, go out there and vacuum it for a long period of time, two weeks, one week. We, we didn't really exactly know how long that was going to take in order to really properly dry the lightweight concrete. Uh, the other questions we had was, even if we dry it, are we actually going to be able to properly attach our new base sheet to the lightweight concrete? During the time that we did our exploratory opening, even though we saw that moisture in the system, we still went ahead and did a um, pull test. And our pull test resulted in over 45 pounds. Usually we, we try to uh, achieve 45 pounds and we feel that that's adequate enough in order to install our new base sheet. So the other consideration is um, we wanted to know if we go ahead and remove the lightweight concrete, we knew that the, that the structural concrete deck underneath it was also wet. Um, and if we were going to install something directly to the concrete deck, we also wanted to make sure that whatever method we use or product we use was also going to be well adhered to the substrate. So, you know, we considered coating the concrete deck. We considered installing a, a fiberglass plies and, and hot asphalt and also torching the vapor barrier. That's kind of the three top items that we had considered. There were some other considerations, but those were the ones that we thought were the top three. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, one of the biggest things, even for all three of these products, we need to make sure that the concrete deck was sufficiently uh, dry enough in order to get proper adhesion of any of those products. Um, one of the other things was that we considered was, you know, whenever they replace a roof, they cut the existing roof out. They usually install the new base sheet um, insulation and roof membrane, and they butt that new insulation directly to the existing roof. And then they tie into that, and then the next day they come and they do another section. So the concerns that we had with this project was, due to the fact that we had so much moisture, we wanted to mitigate any issues with moisture getting into our new roof system. So if, if they kind of proceeded with that same uh, theory, then we would have issues with moisture migrating from the existing into the new. So during the discussions with the owner, the owner, he on, his only concerns was that we could not stop the library operations during the replacement of this roof. Um, they had, the library operates throughout the year, uh, 365 days, there's a couple of days there that they have off, but usually they are open all year. Um, they didn't want to relocate any books or install any large interior protection. And we obviously knew that the contractor did not want to take the risk of exposing that deck for a very long period of time. So once we considered all of the uh, different situations that we can proceed with replacing the roof, we decided to go ahead and remove the existing lightweight concrete to the structural concrete deck. Then we decided to torch apply a modified bitumen vapor barrier install the tapered polyiso insulation with an average of R22, install the three plies of type 4 fiberglass plies and hot asphalt, followed by a smooth modified cap sheet. The owner decided to install a or add a uh, asphalt flow coating coat and gravel. So this is a, a cut through the new system that we installed at the project. So from the bottom, you can see we had the existing concrete deck, we have a primer on the, on the concrete deck, torch gray vapor barrier, two layers of insulation set in hot asphalt, our cover board in hot asphalt, three plies of the fiberglass plies, um, and 
and we applied a, a smooth torch grade membrane, and then we did the uh, flood coat and gravel. So that was the system that we installed at the project. So now that we knew what system we wanted to use, the other issue that we discussed was the amount of moisture within the concrete deck. So we really wanted to know exactly how much moisture we had in there. Uh, we, we wanted to see if it was just kind of at the, at the top surface of the concrete. It was an eight inch slab. We wanted to see if it was throughout the whole eight inches or did we just have you know, minor issues within the top surface of the concrete. So we decided to do the ASCM F2170, which is the standard test method for determining the relative humidity in concrete floor slabs using the NC probe. These probes uh, measure relative humidity and temperature and dew point um, that you can use to correlate how much moisture content you have within your slab. So what we did, we removed the SPF, the existing, light, the existing lightweight concrete, and we drilled holes into the structural concrete deck from the top side, and we installed these probes. Knowing that we had so much moisture in the system, we went ahead and put these sheet metal pans that were set in sealant and attached to the metal deck. And we tried to, to take every step in order to prevent any moisture from getting into our probe. Once moisture gets into our probe, you know, our data would not be collected properly. After we installed the, the probes, we would come out um, several days afterwards and we would use a, a handheld concrete moisture meter. And with that moisture meter, we, we were able to collect the data. And where we select, the amount of probes we selected to install was a total of six probes. We wanted to kind of get a representative area, so we installed three of them in the locations we found most of the moisture. Uh, we installed two of them on the lower side there um, at locations that we found not as much moisture, but we knew that there was some, some damp and wet lightweight concrete. And then we also installed one where we knew that we didn't find any moisture in our roof system or the lightweight concrete. So here's the initial data that we collected from the top side of the, of the concrete deck. As you can see on Pro P1 and Pro P6, you know, we were just not able to, to hold the moisture or the water from getting into our probe locations. Um, so those were just, you know, being wet at all times. Um, and we didn't get exactly any data from that. But as you can see from Pro P2, 3, and 4, you know, our relative humidity was at 96 to 99.9%, uh, which uh, means five out of the six locations, you know, we had a lot of moisture within the concrete deck. These probes were inserted about three, three and a half inches deep into the concrete slab. So again, over at the, at the southwest corner was the only location um, that indicated a 62.0% relative humidity uh, where we knew we had uh, no moisture within the lightweight concrete or the structural concrete during our course. So this just verified the fact that there was no moisture present in that location. Um, so once we understood how much moisture there was in the system, we knew exactly what our design was we outlined some of the contractor requirements, which were to remove the lightweight concrete, dry, clean, and prime the concrete deck, torch apply the vapor barrier, install the roof insulation and roof membrane, and ensure that moisture did not migrate to the new roof system. That was a key thing for us, was to ensure, first of all, that moisture did not get into our new roof system, and second of all, was to ensure that the contractor dry that concrete enough in order to install our new roof system or the, uh, the vapor barrier. So once we had the contractor selected, um, you know, he obviously had some concerns as well. So he came back around and wanted to know, well, how is it that we can prevent any moisture from migrating into the new roof system? And he also had some concerns about, you know, what is the, the time required for drying that concrete deck? You know, new construction, you know, when you ask manufacturers, roofing manufacturers, they'll tell you that uh, approximately 28 days after they initially pour the concrete slab. Now, the reason they say 28 days is because that's when they usually do the breaks and you reach your highest level of strength at that time and you lose about 10% of your relative humidity within that point. The other test method they also ask you to do is the plastic sheet test, the ASTM 
D4263. That is basically installing a, a four mil plastic onto the concrete deck. You tape it on all four sides, you let it sit there for uh, several hours, 24 hours, and you come back and you see if there's any moisture in between the plastic and the concrete deck. If there's any moisture between the plastic and the concrete deck, then it's deemed too wet and you're not allowed to install your roof. But if it's, if it's dry, then you are okay to, to attach your or install your new roof system. Um, and obviously he had some concerns about exposing the deck for very long periods of time, which we knew um, would be a risk. So the approach that we took was <clears throat> once we started removing the lightweight concrete, we noticed that we had about a sixteenth of an inch slope within the structural concrete deck. So we had slope in the structural concrete deck, and you can see in this photo where they cut the existing roof system to the ridge, to the top portion of the concrete deck. So on your left hand side, you know, that, that roof area there, if it, it, it would drain to the um, the drains that you see there in the center of that area. On the right hand side where you see the existing roof system, those would drain to the side of the penthouse roof. Um, the contractor on the closest to the photo here, you can see that the vapor barrier had not been installed yet. That, that just has the, the primer installed and on the far section there is where they've already installed the actual vapor barrier membrane. Now that vapor barrier membrane is also a waterproofing so they went ahead and installed that and left it for several days in order to eliminate any moisture from, in, from getting to the actual structural concrete deck. So the contractor used um, roof cutters. They would cut those into sections that were manageable to remove and take off the site. They also used these uh, hydraulic uh, roof ramps and that just helped them remove the actual lightweight concrete from the structural concrete deck. You can see from this photo that it came out in, in you know fairly good sized pieces and also very small pieces. The dark sections of that lightweight concrete were the ones that were fairly wet, um, but then you can see that you still had a couple of sections there where, where you can pull off very large pieces. The perimeter nailers, they've been exposed to a lot of moisture and you can see that they had degraded um, for a very long period of time. And those all got removed and replaced um, during the project. So the contractor was using handheld torches and a portable hot air blower. In addition to that, they would remove the roof early in the morning. We would leave it exposed for about three to four hours to the sunlight. During that time, they would be using these torches and, and the blowers to assist with the drying of the top surface of the concrete deck. When we had discussions with the manufacturer, they suggested that, you know, we would try as best as possible this method, and as long as we can get adhesion of the primer, they felt it would be suitable to adhere the rest of the roof system. So once the concrete deck was dry enough to adhere the primer, they would install the primer, and then they would torch apply their vapor barrier system directly over the structural concrete deck. So after four or five days of leaving the vapor barrier exposed, um, you know, it, it, we, we left the vapor barrier exposed and did not want to install the new roof system based that if once we install the, the roof insulation on top of that vapor barrier and put our roof membrane, you know, we would not allow any of that heat from the sun to um, continue to dry the, the concrete deck. So we left it exposed for four to five days with the roof membrane installed to ensure that, you know, we didn't penetrate any water um, through the membrane into the uh, structural concrete deck. And then we wanted to perform adhesion tests when we were ready to install the new roof system. So the reason we wanted to perform these adhesion tests was to determine that we had proper adhesion of the vapor barrier, first of all. Um, we wanted to make sure that if the vapor barrier was installed properly, that the primer was also adhering to the structural concrete deck. And we also wanted to make sure that the deck was being properly cleaned. And the key thing was to ensure that there was no moisture in between the vapor barrier and the top surface of that concrete deck. So here's some, some openings that we did in the membrane. 
And as you can see, we have some lightweight concrete residual on the top left-hand corner of the, of the image. Um, on that location, we noticed that there was a lot of uh, lightweight concrete residual that did not allow for proper adhesion of that vapor barrier. On the lower left, I mean on the lower right, you can see that there was very minor uh, spots of residual of the lightweight concrete. The key thing is that, you know, we can still see that the, um, that the primer was still properly adhered to the concrete deck. In addition to that, we could also see that there was no moisture in between the vapor barrier and the concrete deck. So based on the results that we had um, of the openings we made, we determined that we had about 50 to 60 percent adhesion of that membrane. And that was due to the fact that, you know, it was very difficult to clean the lightweight concrete from that structural concrete deck. The, the surface of the concrete deck was very rough and porous and it had a lot of pockets where the lightweight concrete, when it was wet, it was just, it, it was very difficult to, to clean those little pockets out. So um, the contractor was doing the best that he could, um, but we still noticed that there was a lot of issues with, with the condition of the surface. Um, but the key thing was that we didn't have any moisture in between the vapor barrier and the structural deck. So based on the results that we got, you know, we discussed with the contractor additional cleaning methods or cleaning techniques that, you know, he should consider during the process of the installation of the vapor barrier. We suggested that before you install the primer, when you feel that the concrete or the top surface of the concrete um, was ready to, to have the primer installed, is to go back and, and do some more sweeping uh, using power brooms and, and manual brooms and trying to blow that deck as best as possible to try to minimize all that lightweight concrete um, from, from preventing the vapor barrier uh, to adhere. The, um, in addition, in, in the International Concrete Repair Institute, guideline number 310.2-2013, they have a what they call a concrete surface profile. And their profiles are from 1 through 10. And the highest profile that shows the roughest uh, condition of the concrete is a CSP 10. Um, if we compare that to what we had at our project, um, we, we had a CSP 10, if not something higher than that. It was a lot rougher than what's shown for CSP 10. Um, so what we did is we required the contractor to mechanically fasten the base sheet or the vapor barrier at 12 inches on center. As you know, the, the rest of the roof system would be adhered to the vapor barrier, so we wanted to make sure in order to get our uplift and proper adhesion that we wanted to make sure that that vapor barrier was initially installed properly to that structural concrete deck. So here's the uh, contractor installing or drilling holes to install what, they, what we call a, a raw nail uh, that was approximately three inches long and they would install it with a galvanized cast. So once they would install the new roof system, this photo kind of shows after they've installed the roofing plies, um, this is kind of how it looked. And, you know, obviously we still got to install the, the cap sheet, flood coat, and gravel, but this is uh, essentially how it looked once they, they installed the new roof system. Here's a, an overview from the 1979 building looking down, um, kind of showing the contractors cutting out a very large area, um, and they're just trying to dry the concrete as best as possible, install that primer, vapor barrier, and leaving it exposed for uh, four to five days. So they would, they would tear off for a week, um, then they would install new roofing uh, for that following week, and then they would tear off again for another week, and that's kind of the way they, they schedule the process of this, of this project. Uh, we also installed the new through wall flashing between the main roof and the penthouse. We had previously installed it between the 1970 and the 1979 building, but during the re-roofing project, we also installed it at the penthouse roof. So here's the project once it's all done. Um, you can see how we have it all with the, uh, with the flood coat and gravel. We have that copper flashing in between the 1970-1979 building. So this is a uh, you know, pretty much once the project was completed, we had uh, dried in the area. We didn't have any moisture entering into the, the system where we were continuing to wet the top of the structural concrete deck. 
So at this point, we were done with the job, and we wanted to, you know, some of the questions that we still had was, what is what is going on with the moisture in the in the structural concrete deck? Uh, we knew we had very high relative humidity readings, and we knew that we had a lot of moisture during the removal of the roof. So we wanted to know exactly what was going on. This is kind of how we develop into the the research project. Um, what we decided to do was to install additional pros on the underside of the deck. The good thing was that we had a great relationship with the with the users at the library that allowed us to go back in there and continue to use their um, their facilities to do our research program. So with the assistance of Daniel Axon here at our office um, and Jordan Tripp from our office and, and Nina Townley from San Francisco and a few others in Northbrook, we were able to design an Arduino data logger system um, that best fit this project. So with that system, we could monitor the long-term drying effect um, and be able to record it at shorter intervals. We didn't have to go out there with the manual one, the handheld one, um, every you know, two weeks, three weeks, whenever it was, and, and collect the data. What we could do is just leave these data loggers and be able to collect that data at, at um, shorter intervals. So what we selected to do was the F2170 again, um, to install the, the in-suit pros from the underside. As I mentioned, that, that allows us to measure the relative humidity, the temperature, and the dew point, which you can use to correlate how much moisture is in your concrete deck. What we selected to do was install two additional probes at, our, at, at or near the locations we installed the probes on the top side. We had collected that data from the top side of the concrete deck, and we wanted to continue to use that data, so we selected to put two probes at each one of those locations. We installed one that was three inches deep, or three inches from the bottom into the concrete, and the other one was uh, approximately six inches deep into the concrete. We wanted one kind of low on the bottom side of the concrete, and the other one kind of closer to the to our roof system, and see kind of how that moisture was traveling throughout the concrete deck. Um, again, the uh, the Arduino data logger system that we took or that we used was a custom one, and we set it to read every hour. So every hour, we were taking a, a relative humidity, a temperature, and a dew point reading. So here's Tommy Lee from our Austin office uh, drilling a hole into the bottom side of the concrete deck. And then he's installing the moisture probe uh, to that drilled hole where we would install our, our data logger. This is the data logger system um, that Daniel Axon designed. And you can see that he has three different probes. We wanted to take like I said, uh, the six inch probe and the three inch probe, but in addition to that, we also wanted to know what was the relative humidity and temperatures of the interior conditions. So here's our data logger installed to the bottom side of our structural concrete deck. Again, we, uh, we, we wanted to keep those, or install these new probes uh, very close to, if not at the same locations we had installed the probes from the top side. So we went ahead and installed six additional, um, well, six additional locations from the bottom side uh, with a total of 12 probes. Before we get into the data, I wanted to kind of show you this um, image, and this is from ACI 302.2R-06. And, you know, ACI has done a lot of research in, in concrete um, as far as moisture and also it's kind of been done a lot in the flooring industry. So as you can see from this um, image here, this is for an elevated slab, and as soon as you install or you initially install your your slab, you can see on line on it, line A is that you have 100% relative humidity. Then during the drying phase of it, as you leave it exposed, you can see that the, there's there's like a curve effect with line B. You start getting some drying from the top surface, you start getting some drying from the bottom surface. Um, it kind of stays a little bit wetter from the middle, but you still get some drying effect from the top and the bottom. As soon as you put a covering like flooring or, in our instance, a roof membrane, you eliminate the, 
the drying effect from the top surface of that slab. And you can see that the concrete or the moisture within the concrete just equalizes itself from the top, kind of stores, kind of towards the middle, and just kind of stays neutral, but you continue to have a drying effect to the bottom side of that slab. So the interior conditions that we had um, at this building were 70 to 75 degree temperatures, 55 to 60 percent relative humidity, 55 to 60 degree dew point. Uh, the exterior site conditions were about 50 degrees to 90 degree temperatures, 50 to 75 percent relative humidity, 47 to 71 degree dew point, and the roof was completed in May of 2014. It's approximately one year um, tomorrow. So here's some of the data that we collected from those probes. The, uh, the, the three and a quarter inch probes are in red and the six inch probes are in blue. I know it might be a little difficult to read, but I blew up a few of them here so you can see. So um, in July, of 20, uh, July 22 of 2014, you know, in two different probes, you can see that the three inch probe, um, we had 96.4, the other one was 98.6. And the six inch probe that was a little closer to the top side of the slab was 100% relative humidity. Then in uh, February 27 of 2015 um, of this year, we went back again. And as you can see, the, the moisture content in that slab is still at 100%. One of the things is that uh, we, we, we continue to notice is that in the in the southwest corner, we continue to average in the mid 60s for relative humidity. Um, we knew that area was dry, and there has there hasn't been any change with the relative humidity, temperature, or dew point at this location from the beginning of the project. So, in the concrete industry, and discussing this with some of our concrete experts here in the, in in our office, um, in particular. Um, Kevin Copeland, you know, one of the things that they describe as dry and wet in the industry is anything that is over 75% relative humidity, they consider that you will not get any moisture or water to go to the outside of the slab. And anything that is greater than 95%, they would consider you would have a potential of moisture um, getting to the outside portion of, of your slab, either the top or the bottom. Um, now this is something that as you've seen from this presentation, you know, we had moisture contents higher or at 95% relative humidity, and we were still able to accomplish our installation of our of our new roof system. So this has nothing to really correlate between the two. It was just something that they use in the concrete industry to measure the, the moisture content and what they consider dry and wet. Um, but, you know, as far as roofing, this is kind of part of the research um, uh, program that we're doing here is to try to figure out exactly how the effect of that moisture content will be for, for our roof system. So we believe that the concrete will still continue to dry from the bottom side. Um, we believe it's going to kind of like that graph that I show you. We might have covered it from the top side, but it being exposed from the bottom side, we believe that we'll continue to, to dry from the underside and we will continue to monitor that until we deem necessary. Um, as I said, uh, there's, there's been some research in the flooring industry and Mr. Gorin's head and blood has done a, a couple of presentations and has some articles. And one of them that I found he talked about drying times for concrete after water damage. He did that for the Swedish Council for Building and Research in 1993. And one of the things that he mentioned in that article was that rewetted mature concrete when drying from one side at 50% relative humidity and 70 degrees, very similar to the conditions that we have at Texas A&M, it took them 515 days to reach 85% relative humidity. Now, he also discussed about, you know, the water cement ratios within that concrete slab and the curing of that slab have a lot to do with how long it's going to actually take. So it, it can vary from one slab to the other. So it's taken them longer than a year, year and a half or so to, to uh, 
reach 85% relative humidity, we know that our slab is going to take as long, if not longer, to lower the relative humidity or the moisture content within our slab. So in summary, I'm going to turn it back to Edis Oliver. Thank you, Alonzo. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, just to summarize uh, the project, uh, the project was very successful. Uh, it was completed on time, within budget, and uh, essentially within the specifications that uh, we designed the roof for. And we were able to meet the six fundamentals of good roofing that we always try to apply to all of our roofing projects. We had a sound substrate with a concrete deck, wet though it may be, it's still sound. We were able to provide good slope and drainage by means of uh, tapered roof insulation and some slope in the deck. We got positive mechanical anchorage of the vapor barrier. Uh, we have proper flashing of all penetrations, particularly our through wall flashings at the penthouse and the ch uh, change to the 1979 building, expansion joints, and separation of dissimilar materials. So uh, the finished project looks like this. So it's a built up gravel surface roof and uh, the owner was extremely pleased for the first time in many, many years they have no uh, leaks and uh, on the client satisfaction survey the associate dean uh, gave us a 10. So that concludes our formal presentation and we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions at this time. And the first question that we have are what are the specific products that were used in the new roofing system especially the primer and vapor barrier? The well I don't I didn't memorize the actual product of the of the primer or the vapor barrier but it's a US ply was the manufacturer of the of the vapor barrier and the primer. It's a, a manufacturer here in, in Texas. Now I believe it's an SBS uh, torch down. Yes, sir. Vapor barrier. Correct. Okay, the next question we have is what co was consideration given to using a vented roofing system? Uh, by that you mean uh, be, can you be a little bit more specific? Do you mean a venting base sheet or, or a venting, an overall vented roofing system? There was some consideration um, where we discussed putting some wood runners, like laying some wood runners and then putting a plywood um, on top of the wood runners so you can have basically an air gap between the two. But we felt that, you know, the moisture was still a concern um, being installed over, over wood, which would could start rotting or the, the fastener attachment. So we did consider some venting, but as Edis mentioned, is it, is it a vented system like I just described, or is it more of a vented base sheet? Yeah, I, I think the question is referring to the Cooley, uh, the one, uh, the Cooley type of uh, venting roofing system. No, we, we really didn't consider that. Uh, we're familiar with that. Uh, we've not ever done one, or I've never done one, and we don't have enough experience with that uh, to uh, take a crack at it on a on the library, but I'm familiar with the system that I believe you're asking about, and we didn't really uh, consider that. Thank you. The next question is, were the vapor barrier fasteners sealed, and if so, how? The, the vapor barrier fasteners were sealed with the flood coat of, or the, not the flood coat, with the mopping of asphalt over the top of the fasteners. Uh, in other words, the, uh, the uh, isocyanurate roof insulation was mopped in hot asphalt. And so uh, the full mopping of asphalt over the top of the fasteners was essentially the seal to uh, mitigate any vapor migration through the fastener holes themselves. Now on that same um, comment that Edith just made, we also want to make sure that, you know, we all understand that this system was used with an asphaltic type of product where we're mopping the, the insulation and, and torch supplying this vapor barrier. We would not take into this approach if we were going to be doing a single ply system where you're doing adhesives on your structural concrete deck. We think that that would be a total different condition or situation if we were using adhesive ribbons to install our, our insulation versus what we did here on this project. Thank you. The next question is, it appeared that the measurements from the table did not really change over the year of monitoring. Those near 100% stayed near 100%. How do we feel that the slab will dry to the bottom over time? 
Well, based on some of the research that I've done, and there's been a lot of research in the flooring industry, um, it seems like it's acting fairly normal. Um, it seems like based on the water cement ratio, now we were not able to actually take cores um, to, you know, figure out how, what is the water cement ratio of that concrete, but it is an eight inch slab. It's been there since 1970. Uh, we believe that water could have been sitting at that um, location since the 1979 um, addition there. So it's, it's been there for 20, 30 years of having moisture on that, on that surface of that concrete. Um, so we believe that it's going to take a, a very long period of time for it to dry. And I'm sure we will continue to monitor it and, and maybe provide another webinar once we figure out what exactly happens to that moisture. Also, the, uh, the ceiling area, uh, or the area between the ceiling and the, and the uh, concrete deck is a plenum, so it's conditioned space. And so that, we believe, may also uh, help uh, with drying. Okay, thank you. The next question is, in checking for moisture under the installed vapor retarder, did you consider using a rolling tray mix to check for um, moisture accumulation over the five days? We did consider using the Tramex at the time that I, I went to the site. Um, we selected to just do the, the openings at random locations. We ended up doing multiple openings at locations we felt that maybe were, were loose, not properly adhered, um, and we wanted to see why that was. A lot of locations just really was the residual of the lightweight concrete or the, or the conditioned surface of the concrete deck. Thank you. The next question is, should WJE guide specs for roofing over concrete decks uniformly reference the ASTM F2170 test requirement? Well, I don't know what that is. That's the ensued probe. Oh, yeah, okay. Do you think we should put it on the WJE spec? I don't know. I'd, we'd have to think about that. That's certainly, that's certainly a suggestion worth considering, though. I, I, we just have to think about that. All right, thank you. And the last question, how did the vapor retarder and roofing manufacturer, um, what value did they attribute to the uplift resistance for the membrane since modified bitumen membrane manufacturers do not typically look at their system to be mechanically attached? Um, well, Many of the manufacturers, uh, many many of the modified uh, bitumen roofing systems are mechanically attached. Uh, if there's a, uh, if it's just the vapor barrier, for example, uh, if we're roofing over lightweight insulating concrete, we would uh, we would be using uh, base fly fasteners through the base sheet. So uh, the manufacturers agreed with that approach. Okay, thank you. That wraps up all the questions that we have. I'd like to thank our presenters and also to everybody who joined our webinar today. Thanks and have a great afternoon.